As a person who served 26 years in federal prison, I know that my level of patience is a little bit longer than somebody who's justice impacted for the first time, going into the criminal justice system for the first time, or possibly, um, you know, serving a sentence or have a family member serving a sentence. But I want to speak to you from the perspective of, of all that I learned, because when I served my sentence, the only thing I ever heard was we needed longer sentences, we need to make prisons tougher, we need to take programs out of prison. And of course, that has changed. It's changing a great deal, as is evidenced by the First Step Act, by the Second Chance Act, by other reforms, and really just a movement. There's an entire zeitgeist around this entire concept of prison reform where it's more acceptable to be thinking about people as potential neighbors than people we need to lock in cages. And today we had a little bit of information, I think, that bolsters that hope that I have for meaningful reform. And I published it on our website at prisonprofessors.com. I've also sent it to our community inside of prison, but I thought I would read it to, uh, uh, to, to members of our community who may be consuming our content through our iTunes program, through the Prison Professors YouTube channel, or through some other social media platform. My name is Michael Santos, and as somebody who served a long time in prison, I'm always committed to helping others understand what can you do to move the needle in getting a better outcome. And today I saw this article, thanks to one of our subject matter experts who sent it to me, um, of an interview uh, with that Michael Sisak and Michael Bal Balsamo, um, reporters from the Associated Press, um, published the, um, in the AP News Magazine. So I'm going to go ahead and read this article again for those who are consuming content um, on a video or an audio platform, including people in prison. So this article I'm, I've titled, Reforms in the BOP. Now, the outsider brought in to reform the ailing Federal Pri Bureau of Prisons pledged Monday to hold accountable any employee who sexually assault inmates reform archaic hiring practices, and bring new transparency to an agency that has long been a haven of secrecy and cover-ups. Colette Peters detailed her vision in a wide-ranging interview with the Associated Press, her first since becoming director nearly three months ago. She said she wants to reorient the agency's recruiting and hiring practices to find candidates who want to change hearts and minds and systemic abuse and corruption. She would not rule out closing problematic prisons, though there are no current plans to do so. As Oregon's prison director, Peters developed the Oregon way of running prisons, which aims to transform environments inside correctional facilities to be more normal and humane, according to the state prison's website. She oversaw sharp drops in Oregon's inmate population. Skeptics within the federal prison system's rank and file have derided her approach as hug a thug. Peters didn't mind that, but offered a different term, chocolate hearts. Peters said her ideal prison worker is as interested in preparing inmates for returning to society after their sentences as they are in keeping order while those inmates are still locked within the prison walls. Our job, as you have heard me say before, is not to make good inmates. It is to make good neighbors, Peter said. They're coming back to our communities, and so we need to hire the right people on the front end with that kind of thinking to help us do that. It is a departure from the agency's previous recruiting model that stressed the law enforcement aspects of the job. Peter's approach is similar to how prisons are run in Norway, where the focus behind bars is more on rehabilitation and promoting a humane approach. But Peters acknowledges major hurdles to reforming the Justice Department's largest agency, a behemoth of more than 30,000 employees, 158,000 inmates, and an annual budget of about $8 billion. Peters has visited three federal prisons so far as director. Two have been sources of the agency's biggest controversies, a federal woman's prison in Dublin, California, where the warden and several other employees have been charged with sexually abusing inmates, and the federal prison in Sheridan, Oregon, where inmates say they were denied showers during a hunger strike and roughed up by a special tactical team. On Tuesday, she is scheduled to visit U.S. Penitentiary Atlanta, 
with one of the agency's most vocal critics in Congress, Senator John Ossoff, who is a Democrat from Georgia. Senator Ossoff's committee has been investigating the agency and clashed with her predecessor, Michael Carvajal. Peters, in the interview, pointedly acknowledged the agency is facing a massive staffing crisis that is at the center of its myriad issues, which Carvajal had refused to do. Low staffing has hampered responses to emergencies and slowed the implementation of the First Step Act, a criminal justice overhaul championed by Democrats and Republicans in Congress. We are looking for people who want to change hearts and minds, who want to make good neighbors, and safety and security is a top priority, Peter said. And so that is a paradigm shift, and I hope it is one that recruits the right people. Peters said the staffing crisis, exacerbated by the coronavirus pandemic, has only worsened as the agency looks for new ways to recruit officers and retain its staff. A 2021 AP investigation found nearly one-third of federal correctional officer positions were vacant, forcing prisons to use cooks, teachers, and nurses and other workers to guard inmates. Now, the Bureau of Prisons finds itself not only competing with other law enforcement agencies and corporate employers, but with fast food restaurants offering signing bonuses. In some cities, the biggest hurdle has been huge cost of living burdens, and in rural communities, the agency has struggled to find many qualified applicants. Peters also vowed to have zero tolerance for any employee who abuses their position or sexually abuses inmates in their care. We need to continue to hold people accountable. Let people see and understand that if you engage in this type of egregious activity, you are going to prison, she said. A year ago, the Justice Department took the bold step of closing one of its more troubled facilities, the crumbling Manhattan jail where financier Jeffrey Epstein killed himself in 2019. Peters says the agency has yet to determine if the jail, the Metropolitan Correctional Center, will reopen, a task that would require a pricey structural overhaul. She also isn't ruling out closing more prisons as repair bills pile up and inmate populations shift. We will always be analyzing the infrastructure, Peter said. We have billions of dollars in backloaded infrastructure repairs that need to happen at all of our institutions. At some point, there's a return on investment where there is just the cost of repairing them are too high. AP reporting has revealed rampant sexual abuse and other criminal conduct by staff, dozens of escapes, deaths, and severe staffing shortages that have hampered responses to emergencies. I have said in this room I need to hear the good news, the bad news, and the ugly, Peter said. We cannot have any surprises. We have to know what is happening inside our agency so we can help. The Bureau of Prisons has also started to spot check security cameras at prisons across the United States to ensure officers are conducting rounds to check on inmates held in segregated housing units. A major controversy after two officers who were supposed to be guarding Jeffrey Epstein falsified documents claiming to have checked on him while they were really sleeping and shopping online. So, so when I read an article like that, I really get encouraged because Typically, as is indicated by the previous uh, reporting on the previous director, this kind of information was typically swept under the rug. But right now we have a director who is talking about the need for reform and major reform. Is it going to happen overnight? Of course not. This is a major uh, agency. It's the largest agency, I think, under the Department of Justice with more than 34,000 people working there. And many of those people are hardline people. They, as as uh, Director Peter said, a lot of her colleagues are, are referring to her as hug-a-thug. And that's a phrase that I used to hear a lot while I was in prison, hug-a-thug. And it's got a, a, a pejorative connotation. But as somebody who went through this system, I want to say that we will continue to advocate on behalf of all justice-impacted people and we're striving to bring attention to what we can do better as a society to improve outcomes for every justice-impacted person. And that doesn't only include the people serving time, the family members of people serving time. It also includes the people who devote their careers to working in the Bureau of Prisons. And our team is really enthusiastic to be providing more information and reaching more people in prison. 
and we just hope that the people in prison will assist these advocacy efforts by avoiding disciplinary infractions, focusing on preparing for success, developing solid release plans, and, and participating in all types of programs like those that prison professors offers that will help them build a record of success. And for those of you who are looking for more of this information, we urge you to go to the top of our webpage and you'll see under resources our books and courses that we would encourage you uh, to review. And if they find them to be helpful to you and to people going through the system, we encourage you to support our work. Uh, if you're watching this video on, IT on YouTube or listening on iTunes, we do hope that you'll subscribe to our program. My name is Michael Santos, and on behalf of our team at Prison Professors, we believe in you. Thanks.